okay, if you're interested in stock trading, but you don't know where to begin, or you don't know what actually works in the real world, and what doesn't, this free, in-depth course is for you. I'm Mike Bellafuri, and we're one of the top proprietary trading firms located in New York City and proud to have developed number seven and even eight-figure per year traders. We hope you agree this is the top YouTube channel to help you grow your trading account. Garrett here from the New York City desk. As always, you can follow me on Twitter in the link below. Today, we're going to cover the basics of stock trading. We're going to dive deep into this topic with a full comprehensive review of the tools, processes, approaches that professional traders take to the market. By the end of this video, you'll have everything you need to know to get started as a beginner. So if you're new to trading, you're likely asking questions, you know, can you make money? What does it take to make consistent profits? Um, what's the absolute best way to get started? You should be asking these questions. I know how this feels. There's no real established roadmap to becoming a successful trader. So it can be difficult to know where to begin. At one point, not long ago, I was in your shoes. I didn't understand the basics of trading. I mean, heck, I didn't even know what the tape was, something I now watch every single day. Um, I had to find what I truly needed to become successful as a trader. And fortunately, I had the help of SMB Capital, which has built its firm teaching new traders the fundamentals of trading, the steps to take in order to become successful. So, so if you're asking these questions, this video is for you. So, you know, for over a century, people from all walks of life have dedicated their lives to generating profits from the stock market. A lot has changed over the years in terms of technology and the way that traders operate, but the fundamental truths about supply and demand remain the same. And so this fact will become key as we cover some of the major topics today. Navigating this world takes great skill. Fortunately for us, these are skills that can be taught. So. I will lay out in this video what I know about getting started so that you don't have to dig like I did. And if you notice that we return to certain topics a number of times, it's because there are particular things about trading that are just that important. So we want to drive them home. So in this video, uh, we're going to cover a number of topics, including trading terminology, what is stock trading, understanding stocks, the stock market where to trade stocks, the types of stock trading that we can do, how to trade stocks, risks and rewards of stock trading, what you need to become successful, technical analysis, fundamental analysis, the ingredients of a profitable strategy, and specific trading strategies at the end. Let's start with trading terminology, okay? I think this is important just to kind of lay the groundwork. So just like in any medium, Stock trading has its own language. Um, so let's break down some of these terms so that you can sit on a trading floor and know exactly what these people are talking about. It's quite simple once it's laid out for you. If you don't get it at first, that's okay. We'll go into greater detail on many of these topics later in the video. So here are a dozen of the most important terms a trader uses on a daily basis. Number one is stock, right? So also known as shares or equity, a stock is a type of investment that represents ownership share in a company. When you buy a stock, you're purchasing a piece of the company. Market capitalization, number two. This is, this is the total market value of a company's outstanding shares of a stock. It's calculated by multiplying the company's shares by the current market price of one share. Companies with a high market capitalization are often referred to as large caps. Those with medium market capitalization are referred to as mid caps. And those with small market capitalizations are referred to as small caps. Okay, so number three, bull and bear market. A bull market refers to a market condition where prices are rising and widespread optimism 
often sustain the upward trend, right? So we basically have an uptrend in a bull market. Conversely, in a bear market, we have conditions where prices are falling and widespread pessimism off, often sustains the downward trend. So we have a downtrend in a bear market. All right, next we have the bid and the ask. A bid is an order to buy shares of a stock at a certain price. An ask, also known as the offer, is an order to sell shares of a stock at a certain price. Just like at an auction, the highest bid and the lowest ask represent the inside market where most of the business is being done. And we'll kind of return to this auction analogy a little bit because the stock market is much like this. Um, so next we have the spread. This is the difference between the highest bid price and the lowest ask price. It represents a cost associated with trading. With wider spreads, traders are required to pay more to exit their position immediately. Okay, so this is something that has to do with liquidity, which we'll cover later. It's very important. So next we have volume. This is the number of shares of a security traded during a given period of time. High volume often suggests high interest in a particular stock. And that's a theme we're going to return to. Right? That's going to end up being very important to our own trading. Next, we have liquidity, which I just mentioned. This refers to how easily a stock can be bought or sold without impacting its price. High liquidity means the stock can be traded easily and vice versa. So a tight spread and high volume, things we just covered, are two factors that can contribute to high liquidity. A wide spread and low volume are two factors that contribute to low liquidity. Okay, so next we have volatility. This refers to the price movements of a stock or the stock market as a whole. More specifically, volatility is the magnitude of price moves per unit of time. So high volatility stocks are ones with extreme up and down movements in wide intraday trading ranges. Okay, so we're just talking about the magnitude of these moves when we talk about volatility. Next, we have fundamental analysis. This is the evaluation of anything related to the company itself or overall market narratives. A fundamental analyst studies a company's financials, industry, and general economic factors to draw a conclusion about the stock and make trading decisions. So on the other hand, we have technical analysis, our next term. And this is the evaluation of anything related to the actual trading activity of the stock or the movement of the overall market. So a technical analyst is going to study statistical trends in price movement and volume. And they're going to use charts as a key tool. And we're going to cover a lot of charts in this presentation. Um, we will talk about some fundamental analysis as well. Uh, but we're going to cover, as traders, there's a lot of technical analysis because that's where we get information about the price action of the stock, which is very important to us. All right, so next we have the stop loss order. So this is an order placed with a broker to buy or sell a stock when it reaches a certain price. So mainly it's designed to limit a loss on a position. So very important for controlling risk. Next, we have long and short positions. So in trading, if you're long a stock, it means you're initiated a position by buying the stock with the expectation that the price will go up in order to sell at higher prices. Conversely, if you're short, it means you've initiated a position by selling the stock with the expectations that the price will go down in order to buy the stock back at lower prices. So at first, the idea of selling a stock to make a profit can seem a little backwards, but we'll cover the concept of short selling in more detail later in this video, and it'll become second nature. Um, it's, it's really pretty simple. So what is stock trading? So have you, if you've ever seen stories of stock prices going up and down you know, on TV, like erratically, like all over the place, and just wondered how like people make money trading these movements, it's... You know, it's an activity that requires a lot of specific tactics, a lot of understanding of market dynamics. So simply put, stock trading is the buying and selling of shares in publicly listed companies. Traders aim to profit from these fluctuations in the stock prices by buying at lower prices and selling at higher prices. So there are really just two types of positions a trader can initiate, a long and a short position. And we just covered the definitions of these in our terminology section. So 
A trader can get long a stock by initiating a buy order and looking to profit from a price increase by selling the stock. So to visualize this, I like to imagine going to a garage sale and finding a baseball card of your favorite player, projecting this player will have a great season. So you buy the card with the idea that you have a high probability of selling that card at a higher price to collectors online in a few months. Okay, so conversely, a trader can get short a stock by initiating a sell order, looking to profit from a price decrease, right? So instead of an increase, it's a price decrease by buying back the stock, right? And this is called covering your position. This may seem strange at first. How can you sell something you don't own? Well, short selling is made possible by the act of borrowing shares before selling them and then returning them back to the rightful owner after buying back the shares. So to put this short selling into context, imagine borrowing your friend's rare comic book collection and selling it to a buyer. And later you find the same comic book at a discounted price, buy it and return it to your friend. The difference between your selling and buying prices is your profit. So with stock trading, in our modern age, this process is streamlined and it's all done with the click of a button. So the act of buying and selling is only really the tip of the iceberg. So in order to have a shot of becoming profitable over the course of many trades, we have to first understand what to buy and sell and what makes these stocks move. So understanding stocks, like let's, let's just talk about that. Like what is a stock? So, you know, when I buy a stock, do I really own anything? Well, yeah, I mean, stocks represent a fraction of ownership in a company. So when you buy a stock, you do in fact own a portion of the company. And, you know, imagine, imagine you've opened a lemonade stand by issuing stocks. You're essentially inviting people to buy small parts of your lemonade business. So these shareholders now have a stake in your lemonade stand's success, just as you do. And as a shareholder, there are, there are really two ways you can see returns on your investment. There's dividends and there's capital gains. Okay, so dividends are generated from companies sharing a portion of their profits with shareholders as a thank you for their investment. So they're a steadier stream of income, relevant mostly to investors and long-term holders of a stock. So as traders, we're really not focused on this. As traders, we're focused on the capital gains. And these are generated from selling a stock at a higher price than you paid. So active traders focus mostly on this, um, generating income from capital gains. Uh, and this is what trading's all about, right? Capitalizing on the fluctuations in the stock price. So a company's performance influences its stock price. So if your lemonade stand starts selling the most delicious lemonade in town and profits soar, those who own your stock will likely see their value increase. And on the other hand, if your lemonade starts tasting terrible and people stop drinking it, the value of your stock might drop. So these earnings are reported quarterly to the public and they become kind of an essential piece of being a trader is like watching these earnings. So ultimately, and this is important to remember, the price movement of a stock depends on the supply and demand dynamic present in the market. So if demand for a stock is overwhelming supply, the price will rise. And if supply is overwhelming demand, the price will fall. And this is just a fact. And this is like a key thing to remember when trading, right? And it doesn't matter really what the earnings were, or what's going on with the lemonade. If there is supply for the stock, prices will fall. And if there's demand for the stock, prices will rise. So just as your Uber ride price will go up when it's raining because now everybody wants to call a car, a stock price will go up if everyone wants to buy it. So if you've ever watched the news and heard a reporter kind of you know rave about a company's earnings only to see the stock tank the next day, this is when it's crucial to remember the supply and demand dynamic at play. So if a very large player in the market wants out of a stock, there doesn't need to be a fundamental reason or a news story behind the move. If there's selling pressure, the stock will go down. So as traders, we use this dynamic to our advantage. We learn to read the buying and selling pressure and we love volatility because it helps us make money. The stock market, let's talk about the market as a whole. 
And we, t- we talked about the auction analogy earlier, and this is kind of where this comes into play. So if you want to buy and sell something, you need a marketplace. The stock market acts as a marketplace for buyers and sellers of stocks, very similar to that auction. So just as you might bid for a precious piece of art or vintage car at an auction, traders bid for stocks. The trading of these stocks is facilitated by exchanges such as the New York Stock Exchange, and the NASDAQ, which lists the stocks of thousands of companies. Okay, so have you ever been mystified by the hundreds of tickers like flashing across financial news and wondered like, how can I follow all this chaos? Like, how can I organize this? Well, we can group stocks into broad market averages in order to easily digest this information. So to do this, we look to indices like the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the S&P 500, NASDAQ 100, the Russell 2000, which offer snapshots of the market's performance. They track a selection of companies, each with a different focus. So you can think of these indices as the stock market's pulse, like vital barometers of overall health, economic trends. If these indices are on the rise, the economy is often seen as doing well. And if these indices are falling, it might suggest economic downturns. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average, traditionally referred to as the Dow, like that's how people talk about it on TV, is made up of 30 of the largest publicly owned U.S. companies. So think of the Dow as the highlight reel, representing a sample of some of the biggest and most influential companies in the U.S. And we can trade this index via the ticker DIA. Then we have the S&P 500, and that includes the 500 of the largest U.S. companies across various sectors, and it offers a comprehensive snapshot of the U.S. economy's health. So due to its focus on a wide range of industries and large market capitalization, the S&P is often seen as the most accurate representation of the U.S. stock market as a whole. We can trade this index via the ticker SPY. Then we have the NASDAQ 100, and this includes a hundred of the largest domestic and international non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ exchange, with technology making up a significant portion of this roster. So the index serves as a reliable barometer of the tech sector's performance. It's worth noting that a stock can be listed on multiple indices simultaneously. So for instance, Apple is on the Dow and the S&P and the NASDAQ 100. So we can trade this index via the ticker QQQ. And as a trader, I actually trade QQQ quite often because it has all the tech stocks. And then we have the Russell 2000 index. And unlike its counterparts, this hones in on 2000 smaller up and coming US companies. And because these small capitalization companies are often riskier investments, The Russell's often seen as a barometer for speculation, risk appetite within the stock market, and we can trade this index via the ticker IWM. Where to trade stocks? This is a topic that I get tons of questions about. As a new trader, there are actually so many options between brokerages, trading platforms. It can be overwhelming for sure. but this is something that will become very comfortable. Like once you examine the options and kind of see what's out there, it's, it's actually not that intimidating. Um, and you can always experiment with various platforms before you settle on one. So stock trading can take place through several avenues. Online brokers will help you set up a trading account. They offer platforms with tools for independent trade management, such as charts and watch lists. And so, you know, a few of the popular online brokers that many traders use are Thinkorswim, TradeStation, Interactive Brokers, E-Trade, Robinhood. Um, there are more, but those are some main ones. Trading fees are a key component to this. So trade execution, short locates, margin interest, other fees, they'll all be specific to the broker that you choose. So as you gain experience, you may seek out brokers for high volume active advanced day traders, such as Lightspeed, Center Point Securities, Cobra Trading, Speed Trader. And some of these are just more conducive to traders who like to trade a lot uh, intraday and, and place a lot of trades. And then we have full service brokerage firms. 
So these offer a suite of more comprehensive services, including personalized investment advice, portfolio management. They may not provide the features that an active trader is looking for. So a few popular full service brokerage firms include Fidelity, UBS, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Charles Schwab, and you can tell those are those are basically banks. So each each of these options carries its own set of pros and cons, uh, mainly due to cost, services, degree of control that you have over your investments. And then we have charting software packages, and these offer charting and research tools without the ability to place trades. So you may want to investigate other charting options, or you may seek more advanced trading tools after you gain experience. And this is where standalone charting software can come into play. So a few of these popular options include TradingView, TC2000, eSignal, StockCharts.com, MarketSmith, Bloomberg, just to name a few. And just because a company charges a fee for a standalone charting platform, it doesn't mean it's necessarily better than a platform that comes with an online broker account, such as Thinkorswim or TradeStation. Many online brokers and charting software packages offer fantastic charts, indicators, custom scripts, watch lists, stock alerts, financial analysis. Um, so many of these will suffice. Like I can't even really recommend one over the other. It really matters to the individual trader. So ultimately your choice should align with your own trading goals, your style, your desired level of involvement. At, at SMB Capital, we utilize our own proprietary trading platform and tools to manage trades. Um, we conduct research on these. We develop algorithmic trading strategies. Some traders supplement these tools with charting platforms, right? So Thinkorswim, TradeStation, TradingView, TC2000, just to name a few that traders use on our desk. And there are plenty of free options out there that offer more than adequate resources. So let's talk about how to trade stocks. Getting more specific into the nitty gritty here. So you understand that different types of brokerages now, the charting platforms, you know, you've done your research, you've decided to try one that makes sense to you, you might be asking yourself, like, how do I even make a trade, right? So these brokerage accounts are like your personal command center, giving you control over your trades. So here you can place different types of orders. So there are market orders, and these orders execute immediately at the best available price. Think back to the auction analogy, if someone's bidding for the stock at say $60, you can take that bid to buy the stock at $60 by placing a market order. The key thing to understand with a market order is that when you place the order, there's no limit to the exact bid that you will actually take. If liquidity is low or the bid drops to a lower price, the broker will fill you at whatever the best available bid is, regardless of price. So this is the fastest way to buy or sell a stock because you're guaranteed to get filled. But you're also subject to the liquidity level of the market. So then we have limit orders. These orders set a specific price at which you're willing to buy or sell the stock. So unlike the market orders that execute immediately at the best available price, limit orders only fill when the stock hits your predetermined price or better. So for example, if you want to buy a stock, but not for more than say $50, you would place a limit order at $50. In our auction analogy, your order will become a bid at $50. And this type of order is not guaranteed to execute, but when it does, you are assured of getting filled at $50 or better. But then we have stop orders or stop loss order. These orders trigger a market order to buy or sell a stock once it hits a certain price called the stop price. So for instance, if you're long a stock currently priced at say $40 and you want to limit your potential loss to $5 per share, you could place a stop order at $35. If the stock falls, trades below $35, your stop order becomes a market order to sell, getting you out of the position. However, if the stock's price falls rapidly past your stop price, the actual selling price could be lower. Because remember, in this case, your order becomes a market order where there is no limit to the price at which you get filled. So then we have stop limit orders. These orders are a combination 
of stop orders and limit orders. So once the stop price is reached, the stop limit order becomes a limit order to buy or sell at a specified price or better. And these are the kind of stop orders that I use. This gives you more control over the price at which the trade is executed. But just as in a normal limit order, there's the risk that the order may not fill at all if the, stock's price, if the stock price moves away from the specified limit price after the stop price is hit. So for example, let's say you set a stop at $55 with a limit price at $54. In this case, the order will turn into a limit order once the price trades below 55, filling you anywhere from 55 down to 54. But if the price continues to fall and skips over $54, the limit order may not execute. So now that you can visualize the different types of orders, their effects, think back to our original definition of liquidity. A highly liquid stock most likely gives you a better chance of getting filled. A highly liquid stock might require looser limit prices on stops or might cause you to get slipped on a market order, which is a term used to describe the instance in which the market moves past your intended execution price. And remember, just like any business, trading comes with a cost of business, which include commissions, and transaction fees, as well as the spread, which as you now know is the price difference between the highest bid and the lowest ask. If you pay the ask to get long, the only way you're guaranteed to exit immediately is by hitting the bid with a market order. So the larger the spread, the more it costs a trader to execute. If you're interested in how these specific order types come into play when trading real world setups, I made a video about it on our channel and we can link it up, up above. Let's talk about the types of stock trading. So now that you understand the basics of what the stock market is and how we can participate in it, you may be asking, you know, what kind of trader should I become? You know, how, how should I trade? There are various styles of stock trading, each tailored to different risk profiles and, and even lifestyle choices. So for instance, some styles might suit those who can devote their entire day to trading while others may be more suitable for those who can only dedicate a few hours a week. An easy way to break down the different styles is by time frame. And this is a measure of how long a trader is looking to hold a stock position. So there are four basic time frames a trader might employ. Number one is intraday trading. Number two, swing trading. Three, position trading. And then we have investing. And in this video, we'll focus on the former three types because investing really falls outside the scope of active trading for the most part. So let's talk about intraday trading. Intraday trading is like being a sprinter in a race. An intraday trader enters and closes out a trade all within a single day. So these can be scalp trades, which are very quick trades based on short-term signals, or they can be move-to-move -move trades meant to capitalize on intraday swings in the market. And if you're interested in learning more about these types of trades, intraday trades, scalps, move to move trades, and trades to hold, I made a video about them. We can, we can link it up here. So because intraday trades are meant to capture short price fluctuations, intraday traders often utilize a large amount of capital or leverage in order to execute these trades. And they typically set very close stops, meaning they plan to sell the stock if price drops a small amount to limit losses. Due to the quick turnover of trades, intraday trading requires constant attention, quick decision-making skills, and a deep understanding of short-term market movements. Intraday traders are typically required to sit in front of the screens all day. All right, so the most elite intraday traders on our desk possess the ability to process information very quickly. Um, and so that's, that's something that you, know, you might key in on. Like if you are the kind of person that processes information quickly and you like that kind of quick thinking, like you might fall into an intraday trader category and really excel there. All right, so next we have swing trading. And swing trading can be thought of as, it's like the middle distance race. A swing trader holds a position for several days, even weeks, aiming to profit on short-term price swings and often has multiple positions open at the same time. Traders employing this style need to anticipate market trends and time their moves to optimize their profits. So while swing trading doesn't call for quite as much 
speed as intraday trading, it demands patience. So, you know, strategic foresight and act for understanding market momentum, like these are all the kind of things that a swing trader is going to possess. Swing trader must still spend much of their time in front of the screen and be constantly aware of their positions. Um, the top swing traders on our desk possess the ability to multitask and analyze a lot of information at once. And then we have position trading. So this, on the other hand, is kind of like the marathon of stock trading. A position trader holds a position for months or even years with the aim of profiting from long-term price trends. So a position trader typically allows more room for their trades to work and bases their analysis on the like, big picture ideas. Position trading requires far less screen time and daily attention to the price fluctuations of the positions, but a position trader might not have to watch quotes all day, but they still have to find time to develop a sound strategy and recognize quality trading signals. So that's just gonna take up just as much commitment and just as much time as a swing trader or intraday trader. Top position traders possess the ability to analyze information in a deep and multi-dimensional way. So with each of these trading timeframes, a trader can utilize both fundamental and technical analysis to make decisions. And a trader can employ a number of different setups to make trades. So a setup is a statistically repeatable pattern that informs a trader that a trade is on the horizon. And we'll dive more into detail on trading setups later in the video. So let's talk about the risks and rewards of stock trading. And you know this could very well be the most important section in this video for a new trader, because at its core, stock trading comes down to risk, rewards, and probabilities. The combination of these factors is what gives us an edge in the market. So, you know, of course, just like any any other business, trading stocks does not come without risks. Market volatility can whip the value of a stock back and forth, and in the blink of an eye, you know, our gains can morph into significant losses if the stock price takes a nosedive. So this is why we trade with safeguards, right? So, you know, professional savvy traders are in control of their risk and equip themselves with risk management tools like stop orders. And they place these stop orders in strategic levels in order to minimize risk while also giving themselves a high probability of success in the trade. Some traders set profit targets to help manage their potential returns. So a simple way to set a profit target is by placing a limit order to sell the position above the market at a price at which you'd be happy to exit for a profit. Other traders might set trailing stops, which, you know, for a long position, as price rises along with the stock, you know, the, the price of the stop also rises as the stock moves, right? So if it reverses a meaningful amount, the position is exited at a profit. So you might be wondering, like, how do I balance these risks and rewards so that I become profitable? And that's what this is all about. So for one, a strong self-awareness is key, right? Because, you know, to successfully implement a trading strategy that suits you, like, you've got to kind of understand yourself. So you should have a sound understanding of your own risk tolerance, your own goals. And sizing your trades is a crucial factor in trading successfully, right? Your share size and stop level should always reflect how much you're willing to lose on a single trade. So simply multiply your share size by the price difference between your entry and your stop, and you have your risk. So to get your share size, simply divide your desired risk amount by the price difference between your entry and your stop. This is the kind of math we do in our heads when trading every day. So just as an example, let's say you buy a stock at 80 and think it can go to 86. So you place your stop at 78 because you think it should not trade below 78. So you want to risk $100. So since you have a $2 stop, you now know that you can buy 50 shares at 80 to risk $100. Like that's just 100 divided by 2 equals 50. Right? And now you know that with a $6 target, if the stock trades to 86, your reward will be $300, right? That's just 50 times six equals 300. So in the, in the, in the example, this three to one, right? Risking 100 to make 300, this three to one relationship between reward and risk is something traders will focus on. So let's define two key terms that have to do with this. So profit loss ratio. 
This is a measure that compares the average profit of a trading system to its average loss. So for instance, if on average we either lose 50 or make 100, our profit loss ratio will be two to one. In other words, our average winner is two times the size of our average loser. The second term is win rate. This is a measure of the number of profitable trades relative to the total number of trades. It's expressed as a percentage. So for example, if a trader makes 100 trades and wins 60 of them, their win rate would be 60%. If your profit loss ratio is very high, you can afford to lose more often. So think about it, if you're realizing a three to one profit loss ratio on your trades, you only need to win more than 25% of the time to eke out a small profit, bearing transaction costs. For every three times you lose, you need one winner to cover the losses. And then on the other hand, like if your win rate is very high, you can afford to lose more on your losers than you make on your winners. So imagine you win 68% of the time. Because you're winning more than twice as often as you're losing, you only need a 0.5 to 1 profit loss ratio in order to eke out a small gain. So this isn't an opinion, this is just math. And it's just interesting to think about it in this way because you can start to see the kind of metrics, the kind of risk rewards and probabilities that you need in order to have edge in the market. So the profit loss ratio and win rate together can determine if a strategy is profitable or not. This is why traders are always thinking about risk reward and probabilities when executing and developing strategies. As a trader demonstrates edge and strong performance in a particular strategy, he or she will incrementally increase the risk and therefore the share size in order to grow the strategy. And again, these increments should reflect your own understanding of your own risk and tolerance and goals. All right, so now that we've laid out the groundwork for trading stocks, let's dive into some of the tools traders use to gain an advantage in the market. Technical analysis. So by now you know that technical analysis is the study of any information that comes from historical price movements and volume. This information can come in the form of price patterns, statistical indicators, relative strength, or weakness. Since most technical analysis is centered around price charts, let's examine how to read a candlestick chart, which is the most common chart style used by traders. Okay, so what is a candlestick chart? Well, the candlestick chart is a highly visual tool that's part of almost every trader's arsenal. So simply put, a candlestick chart is a type of price chart. It differs from a traditional line chart in that it offers much more information about price movement. Okay, so here's an intraday chart of SPY. In this example, each candle represents five minutes, and the chart starts at 9.30 a.m. and ends at 4 p.m., so it encompasses the regular trading hours. For every candlestick chart, each candle represents a specific time interval called the time frame and illustrates four significant price points within its respective time frame. The open, the high, the low, and the close. Okay, so let's break down a single candle so that we can learn to interpret price action from one of these candlestick charts. Each candle has two major components, the body and the wick. Okay, the body of a candle is the rectangular section within the candle and it represents price movement between the open and the close of the candle's time interval. To determine the price direction of the candle, we must understand the coloring of the body. Most often, an up candle body will be colored green, while a down candle body will be colored red. Occasionally, especially when color is not an option, an up candle body will be hollow, while a down candle body will be filled in. The color de designations of the body depend on personal preference, as most charting platforms allow for customization. Okay, so where is the open and close of a candle? Okay, the open is the price at the beginning of a candle's time interval, and the close is the price at the end of a candle's time interval. Because the body represents a net change from open to close, the open and close will be located at each end of the body. 
So to find the open, pinpoint the bottom of a green body or the top of a red body. And to find the close, pinpoint the top of a green body or the bottom of a red body. All right, the wick, on the other hand, sometimes referred to as a shadow, is the thin line extended from either side of the body. So the extremes of each wick represent the price extremes of the candle and contain the high or low of the candle's range. All right, so where's the high or low? So naturally, to find that, we pinpoint the highest price point of the candle, and it could be an upper wick, or it could be the open or close. And then to find the low, we pinpoint the lowest point in the candle, which could be a lower wick, but it also could be the open or the close. So in each of these examples that you see here, the high and the low can be found at the extremes of the wicks on either end of the candle. And now we can see why we call them candlestick charts, right? We, we combine the rectangular body with a thin wick and we, we kind of get the shape of a, of a candlestick. So by interpreting the structure of the candle, we can easily identify the open, high, low, and close of each candle's time interval. So then we combine these candles together and we get our chart. Okay, so a candlestick chart is more informative than a line chart because a line chart only illustrates the close of each time interval. And that's why candlestick charts are more helpful when assessing price action. So how do we interpret these candlestick charts? So now, now that we understand how the candle's constructed, let's kind of bring it to life a little bit and examine some of the ways we can use these candlestick charts to read the price action. So we'll examine the range of the candle along with the length of the body and the wicks, and then take a look at what it means to use different time frames. Okay, so the range of the candle can tell us something about the volatility of the market. The length of the body and the wicks can tell us even more information about the price action within each candle. A candle with a long body signifies a strong directional price move within its time interval. A series of consecutive large directional up or down candles can represent range expansion, and a strong trend. A candle with a narrow range, on the other hand, signifies minimal price movement within its time interval. A series of consecutive narrow range candles at similar prices or within the range of the previous candle can represent volatility contraction and price consolidation. A short body with long wicks on both ends signifies minimal net change between the open and the close within a large range. So these candles often represent indecision by market participants, right? There was a huge range, but it really closed at the same place that it opened. So we can kind of see that the market doesn't know where it wants to go. A very long upper wick and a close near the low of the candle tells us that price attempted to rally and was rejected all within the time interval of the candle. So a series of long upper wicks or one very aggressive upper wick at a key price level can represent rejection at potential resistance. And then conversely, a very long bottom wick and a close near the high of the candle can tell us that price attempted to drop and then was bought all within the time interval of the candle. A series of long bottom wicks or one very aggressive bottom wick at a key price level can represent absorption at potential support. The elements of each candle are really building blocks that tell us a story about the price on the chart. Okay, so as these candles print, we're assessing the price action as it goes. And so the entire story told through the cumulative effect of the candles on a chart is much more important than any one candle in isolation. And so we can use different time frames to zoom in and out in order to see the entire picture. Okay, so as you know, each candle represents a time interval referred to as the time frame. So on a one minute time frame, each candle represents one minute of price action. And on a 30 minute time frame, each candle represents 30 minutes of price action. And on a daily time frame, each candle represents one day of price action from the 9.30 a.m. open to the 4 p.m. close and so on. So a new candle will start printing for the current time interval after the previous candle closes. A higher time frame refers to a longer time interval, such as a daily or weekly chart, and provides a more zoomed out perspective. 
and a lower time frame refers to shorter time intervals, such as a five or one minute chart, and provides a more zoomed in perspective. So I like to use a two minute or five minute chart to look at one or two days of price action. And I like to use a 15 minute or hourly chart to look at anything from five days to a month of trading. And I like to use a daily or weekly chart to look back over the course of a quarter, a year, or, or even longer. So when you start to use candlestick charts, play around with the time frames to visualize which time frame represents your trading style, the way that you wish to look at the market. It's a, bre it's a best practice to utilize multiple time frames to get a multi-dimensional view of the market. So now we can add volume to these charts. Okay, so let's talk about that. So now we understand how to read candlesticks. Um, we can actually include the volume for each of these bars, and that's going to show up as a subgraph at the bottom of our chart. Each volume bar represents the amount of shares traded during the corresponding candles time frame. So as we read the chart, we can associate the volume traded with each candle's price movement. This can be helpful when assessing significant moves. So in this example, notice how the volume increases on this gap down and continuation. There was clear interest in selling this stock on this day, and we can see that by looking at the volume. So traders look at volume to analyze the participation behind a price move. How many shares were traded here? Right, That's a question that a lot of traders will ask at certain points. How many shares were traded compared to its average? So we'll cover this dynamic in more detail later in the video. So now let's talk about technical indicators. Okay, So everything in technical analysis is pure math. And this is because everything's a function of time, price, and volume. Okay, so the candlestick chart is a graphical representation of price points over time. The volume bars below the candlesticks are pure volume, number of shares traded. And this can certainly be enough for some traders to analyze the technicals. However, there are also things called technical indicators that break down the math of time, price, and volume in different ways. So let's dive into four of my favorite technical indicators so that you can get a feel for what these things are and how they can help us trade. Moving averages. A moving average is the average price of a stock over a specified time period. The reason it's called a moving average is because this specified time period rolls ahead as new bars print. So the bars used to calculate the average move along with time. And we can plot a moving average on our price charts like this. Right, so common moving averages on, on a daily chart, for instance, used by many traders and investors are the 21-day moving average, the 50-day moving average, the 200-day moving average, and these are all shown on this chart. So think back to how these indicators are just math. These moving averages are average prices. They represent the mean on various time frames. So for example, the 21-day moving average shown here in purple is the average price over the last 21 trading days, which is about a month. The 50-day, shown in yellow here, is the average price over the last 50 days. And the 200-day, our longest moving average on the chart, shown in blue, shows the average over 200 days. This chart shows daily candle data for the last three years. So notice how during the first half, rough, roughly the July of 2020 into the end of 2021, the moving averages are stacked and orderly, demonstrating a clean uptrend. Then when the bear market begins in 2022, this pattern breaks and the moving averages become much less orderly. We can use moving averages to see if price is trending on a time frame, just like in this example, and assess how extended it might be from its mean. So most traders use moving averages as guides rather than spe specific price levels. All right, let's talk about VWAP, our second indicator. VWAP stands for Volume Weighted Average Price. It's a cumulative average of price from the first bar of calculation, each bar weighted by volume. So just like a moving average, we can plot it on our price chart like this. Most traders use an intraday VWAP anchored from the first bar of the day, as shown here on this one minute chart of NVIDIA. Some traders anchor their VWAPs freely and use them on higher time frames. VWAP represents the average transaction price for the period in which it calculates. So traders use VWAP to visualize the relationship between supply and demand over that particular period. 
if price is holding above VWAP, it is thought that buyers are in control. If price is holding below VWAP, it's thought that sellers are in control. And if price is above and below VWAP, there may be indecision or a battle going on between buyers and sellers. All right, ATR, our third indicator. ATR stands for average true range. And the average true range of the price bars over a specified time period. So just like the moving average, this time period is rolling. So ATR measures the volatility of the market. So many traders on our desk look at the daily bar ATR of the stock they're trading on a regular basis. This metric represents the average daily range of the stock and can be tremendously helpful in assessing on relative terms how far a stock has rallied intraday. So for an, for an example, let's just say Tesla daily ATR is $12. So instead of saying like Tesla is up six bucks in the first hour of trade, a trader will say Tesla is up half an ATR in the first hour. This provides a better understanding of its typical price movement, as we can see in this example that six bucks is a big move for Tesla to make in an hour. All right, Arval, our fourth indicator. Okay, so this is relative volume. And it's crucial to finding active stocks, stocks that are in play. If a stock typically trades 2 million shares by 10.30 a.m., but today it has traded 6 million shares by 10.30 a.m., we consider this stock to be doing 3R vol. That's three times its average volume. This indicates that there is considerable interest in the stock today. So sometimes if news you think is significant is reported on a stock, you can check out the R vol to confirm your suspicion. If the stock is doing normal volume, it's highly likely the market doesn't care about the news. But if the stock is doing three, five, or 10 times its average volume, then you know this move has generated significant interest. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about why these technicals matter. Okay, so the concept of a short squeeze is actually a really good example to tackle when we talk about technicals, right? So, you know, why do we analyze the action of a stock itself when really the stock price is supposed to be a reflection of how well the company is doing financially, right? The fact is, that's not always the case. So think back to our discussion of supply and demand and how it's the buying and selling pressure of the stock itself that moves the market. So oftentimes this buying and selling pressure transcends any fundamental reason around the quality of the company. And there's, there's really no better example for this than a massive short squeeze in a stock. So a short squeeze is an aggressive move higher in price caused by an overwhelming amount of short covering in the stock. So think about it. Sentiment in the stock is very bearish. Positioning is skewed to the short side. Sentiment in this case is a contrarian indicator, right? So too much short positioning creates a lot of potential demand in the stock. So now we have a dynamic where there's an abundance of short sellers who someday will have to cover their positions by buying back the stock, like hence potential demand. So what if price starts to rise and it causes these traders to cover as their stops start to get hit? Well, this creates a feedback loop where price can rise faster and further than one might expect in this situation, right? So in this, ca in this case, everyone is a buyer. So in the beginning of 2021, GME, GameStop, the infamous leader from the meme stock era, squeezed from you know, below 20 to about 500 in like one month, nearly 190 times the low of, that it put in nine months earlier in April 2020. So this was an incredible short squeeze on massive volume, and the company itself was generally losing money. So if you read the technicals of the stock, you would have been able to identify the short squeeze and witness multiple technical breakouts on elevated volume along the way. Now let's talk about fundamental analysis. So unlike technical analysis, fundamental analysis is the study of information that comes from the performance of the company itself rather than the action of the stock. So this can include balance sheets of financial report and news catalysts that may change the way the market sees the company. So after all, you know, by trading stocks, we own shares of the company, and so a trader might want to understand if the business is growing or not. So when looking at fundamentals, it's always important to think about what might be a surprise to the market versus what might already be priced in. 
So just because a company has a strong balance sheet and tremendous growth, it doesn't mean that it will trade higher in the near future. But if we can find instances where the fundamental picture changes and forces the market to rethink the stock, then we have a situation where the supply and the demand relationship in the stock might shift dramatically. So think back to our baseball card example. If you buy the baseball card of your favorite player expecting him to have a good season, but the consensus of the entire baseball nation is that he will have a great season, then he might have to win league MVP or win a championship this year for him to surprise the market and for that card to significantly rise in value in the near future. So earnings season, which happens four times a year, is the time when public companies report quarterly earnings. These reports can offer fantastic opportunities to trade active stocks with shifting fundamentals. For some traders, earnings season is their playoffs. Personally, I like to combine technicals with the fundamentals to make trading decisions. But when the rubber hits the road, the price of the stock is what we're actually trading and the supply and demand dynamic for the stock is what moves the market. And so that's an important fact to remember. All right, so now let's shift to what you need to become successful. Okay, so many of us grew up playing sports or learning a musical instrument. And, you know, if you've ever studied the masters, or maybe you are one yourself in one of these fields and wondered how these people get so good. So, of course, there's a lot that goes into it, and trading is no different. These are all high-performance endeavors, and they require routine practice, a high level of focus. Okay, so... Let's talk about trading fundamentals because that's one of the key topics here that we're going to have to really, really drive home. So when I was a kid, my dad was a basketball coach. He helped coach a youth program and developed high-level Division I athletes as well as actually one career NBA player. There were certain things that he required his players to practice every day, things like footwork, dribbling drills, foul shots. And these are all fundamentals. So in trading, we also have fundamentals that we should master if we want to have a chance at becoming elite. Things such as stock selection, chart reading, tape reading, risk management. These are all fundamentals that SMB teaches its new traders. So let's talk about stock selection. And as, as Bello wrote in One Good Trade, you're only as good as the stocks you trade. So this is absolutely true. If you're trading the wrong stocks, you will not make money. So imagine... As an example of this, for an analogy, you're the best concert pianist in the world. So just before your concert begins, you're given a terribly written piece of music to play for the audience. So in this case, no matter who is playing it, it just sounds awful. So now your hands are tied. You won't be able to sound good, right? Trading is the same. Stocks are our vehicles, so we have to choose the ones that will move well. So the stocks you choose will largely depend on the strategy that you trade, but generally there are some universal things I like to look for. So one of them is a fresh news catalyst. So a news catalyst that catches market participants off guard. So this will fuel participation in the stock, create a supply and demand imbalances that could generate opportunity for traders. And this can be as fast as breaking news or as slow as a large fundamental shift that fuels the stock for weeks or even months. The second thing is relative volume, RVOL, right? So looking at the amount of volume the stock is trading relative to how much it usually trades is typically a fantastic way to measure the level of increased participation and interest in the stock. This can be measured intraday or over the course of a number of days. The third thing is relative strength and relative weakness. So finding a stock that is significantly stronger than its peers or significantly weaker than its peers can be a great way to filter for stocks that have unusual trading activity. Okay, the fourth thing is a technical catalyst. Okay, a stock with an A plus technical setup can present great risk reward trading opportunities. This could be a hold of a significant price level or a gap extended significantly from its mean. And these are a few things that we will get into later in the video when we get more specific about setups. Okay, the next thing, respecting price levels. So if a stock is respecting price levels and trading well, 
then this becomes a candidate, especially if other factors are aligning. So the cleanliness of how a stock is trading often reflects significant strength or weakness and something I want to gravitate towards. So if a stock is trading erratically and unpredictably, I don't want to be involved. And so we say that a stock is in play if it's exhibiting any of these behaviors that demonstrate an unusual amount of activity and interest in the stock. And ultimately, as traders, we want, to, we want range, we want liquidity, you know, we want direction in the stock we're trading. Trading in place stocks will help us find better risk reward opportunities. All right, so now let's talk about chart reading, another fundamental in trading. So chart reading is the study of historical price movement and volume of the stock that you're trading. Technical analysis, something we define briefly, is any kind of information gleaned from the price movements and volume of the stock. So naturally, traders look at charts to visualize these technicals. The price movement of a stock is caused by the buying and selling from market participants. So recall the supply and demand dynamic that we spoke about earlier. We can use charts to see this dynamic at play. We might identify demand at certain price levels where buyers have stepped in and pushed the stock higher, and we often call this potential support. So this chart shows Tesla getting bought twice at the same price level. Similarly, we might see supply at a certain price level where sellers have stepped in and pushed the stock lower, and then we often call this potential resistance. This chart shows Tesla getting sold twice at the same price level. These become significant levels of interest. When the stock trades back into these levels, we will watch closely. Support and resistance levels typically reveal themselves when the stock has developed a trading range. These two examples were both taken from the same Tesla chart. So let's zoom out a little bit to identify this trading range in Tesla. So here the blue rectangle represents our trading range. On the right side of the blue rectangle, we can see the price finally broke the range to the upside, came back, retested, held, and traded higher. So this is called a breakout, a powerful setup that we'll cover later in the video. So when a stock is not stuck in a range, there might be an uptrend in place, established by higher highs and higher lows and an upward sloping price path. This chart shows NVIDIA in a clear uptrend with the higher highs and higher lows marked on the chart. A downtrend, on the other hand, is established by lower lows and lower highs and a downward sloping price path. So this chart shows QQQ in a clean downtrend, and this time with price swings within the downtrend marked on the chart. So we might see big volume surge on a break of a key price level, and this signifies increased interest and participation in the price move. So this chart here shows SMCI, break out above a key price level on significant volume. You can see this surge in volume on the initial breakout, and then again, a pickup in the volume on the secondary breakout. These are all simple examples of how traders use charts to look at historical price and volume patterns to help frame the current market and the risks, rewards, and probabilities around their trades. Next, we're gonna talk about tape reading, another fundamental of trading. So tape reading is the study of the order flow of the stock that you're trading. Tape is a tool that allows traders to see the orders that are getting executed on the bids and the offers in real time. The tape consists of two components, the level two and the time in sales. So the level two, this is the order book. It shows the bids and the offers for the stock that you're watching. So the highest bid and the lowest offer comprise the inside market and when you're placing a market order, you will be able to see the bid or the offer that you'll be taking and the size that it will be showing. So in this example of my level two, the inside market is at the top, highlighted in yellow. NVIDIA is showing 31 shares at 462.72 on the bid and 33 shares at 462.84 on the offer. So the bid side is on the left with the highest bid at the top. And so, of course, the ask side is on the right with the lowest offer at the top. In this case, the spread is 12 cents, which we get by subtracting the highest bid from the lowest offer. 
And if we pay the 462.84 to get in, we have to sell the 462.72 to get out. And then we have the time in sales. This is also known as the PRIS. So this is a record of real time transactions that are going off in the stock that you're watching. So these transactions represent aggressive orders that are hitting the order book and taking shares from the bid or the offer. So in this example of my time in sales, we can see the orders that are getting executed on the time in sales for NVIDIA. In this example, the most recent order that hit the tape was the red sale of 10 shares at 460.19 shown at the top. All other prints are buys as indicated by the green color. On my box, I do not show the actual time of day because these orders are zooming by so quickly in real time. So for me, this info is unnecessary. What I do care about is the speed of the tape, the color indicating if it's red for a sale or green for a buy, the price and the size. The market center is also shown on the left. So traders will watch how the time and sales interact with the level two, and this is how we see the order flow. So in this example, the time and sales is shown along with the level two for NVIDIA. And this is my tape. This is how I watch the stock that I'm trading. We can see that the last transaction that took place was a buy of 16 shares at 459.85. We can also see that the current highest bid is 459.76 and the current lowest offer is 459.88. When we go to place a market order to buy NVIDIA, we can expect to get filled at 459.88 until those offers are all taken or pulled. When our order gets filled, it will flash across the time and sales. In this case, there are a total of 600 shares offered at 459.88, and that's because one represents 100 shares, and there are six of these 100 shares offered at 459.88, all at various market centers. So once those offers disappear, the market will move to the next offer at 459.89. So let's say your stock is trading at 60.80 and you passively post a limit order to sell 100 shares at 61. Your order, if it doesn't immediately get filled, will now be seen sitting in the order book on the level two. Your 100 shares will be there at 61 waiting for some aggressive trader to come by and pay the offer at 61 and take your shares. Now let's say you see on the level two that the highest bid is at $60 and it's showing 1,200 shares to buy. You decide to aggressively send a market order to sell 100 shares. When you sell 100 at the market, your 100 shares at 60 will flash across the print screen in red letters as it hits that 1,200 share bid. Now you will have sold 100 shares at 60 and the bid will now show 1,100 shares because you took 100 of the original 1,200. This is how the time in sales interacts with the level two. So in real time, there are many trades going off all at once and traders use the tape as a way to visualize the order flow and see buying and selling pressure at certain price points. It can seem very overwhelming at first, but the more you watch it, the more it makes sense. So when you watch the tape, imagine the prints on the time in sales as water pressure and the bids in the offers on the level two as a river dam. So like with enough pressure, the aggressive orders can take all the size on the bid and offer. And if the, bid, if the dam is not strong enough, then the aggressive orders will push through the dam to the next price level. And this is how markets move. So whether you're an intraday trader looking to play off particular bids and offers, or whether you're a swing trader looking to assess the character of the tape, and see the order book as you're executing a trade, reading the tape is valuable skill for, for any trader to have. The tape is a key part of my trading setup, which I do describe in a video about my setup, which we can link above. Um, so now let's talk about risk management. And again, another fundamental of trading. Risk management is important to understand before you start trading with real money. And that will keep you in the game so that you can continue to learn and build your craft. So at SMB, each trader and, and each account has a daily loss limit. And this means that there's a certain amount we are allowed to lose before our account is no longer able to put on risk for the day. And this may sound you know, mean or, or disruptive, but it's actually doing us a great service. Some days, 
the market's more difficult than others. Some, t- some days it's more opportunistic, right? Some days we just don't have it as traders. It becomes important to recognize these days and let your foot off the gas and wait for only the best setups. We discussed earlier how it's possible to predefine our risk in a single trade. Well, this individual trade risk becomes a function of our daily loss limit. So we can set our risk per trade to gracefully interact with our loss limit and trade within our own risk guidelines. So when we grow, when our strategies grow, we increase our daily loss limit and our risk per trade. So when you start out trading, decide how much you're willing to risk per day and design your trade risk around that number. This will keep you within your own guardrails and assure that you survive as you grow towards becoming a profitable trader. All right, let's switch to trading process, okay? Because this is another key element in order to become successful. You've educated yourself on the fundamentals of trading, right? So how can you assure that you're doing everything you need to do to grow and advance your abilities on a daily basis? So when my dad was coaching our basketball team, it was not enough that we learned the fundamentals. We had to practice them every day and build our arsenal of moves and game time awareness and all that good stuff. So we would have a process for this. 30 minutes of dribbling drills, 500 shots a day, tape review, team building exercises, weight training. So in trading, our process is what keeps us developing and adapting to changing market conditions. So we'll discuss things like the playbook, review work, research, technology, game planning, even personal care, um, stuff like that, as well as trading rules. So let's start with the playbook. When an NFL quarterback takes the field, he's not just winging it. He has a specific plays that he and his coach call depending on the game time situation. And this allows them to follow a process and make sure they're maximizing their edge on every possession. So how do the QB and the coach keep track of these plays and refine them and study them? Well, they have a playbook. So trading is actually no different. A playbook is a, for us, is a document compiled by the trader that catalogs his or her her setups with specific examples broken down with charts, trade variables, market statistics. So as a new trader, you start without a playbook, so you have to develop one. As an experienced trader, you'll want to refine and add to your playbook as you go. So I would recommend start by reverse engineering successful plays that make sense to you mark up the charts, take screenshots, record the variables that make this play actionable and repeatable, record market conditions that coincide with your setup, and categorize these examples into clearly defined setups. And really, like, don't worry about making mistakes. As you add trade examples to your playbook, you'll find that you're improving at identifying A-plus trades, and you might choose to eliminate older, less powerful examples as they become less relevant. When I look back to some of my own original playbook entries, I can't believe how muddled and naive they were. So, you know, we have to start somewhere and this is a best practice that will help you figure out what kind of trader you'll become. So now when we have a playbook, when the opening bell goes off, you'll start watching the market. You'll be armed with specific variables that will help you make calculated decisions, just like the NFL quarterback. Then we have something called the book of charts. And this is very similar to a playbook. It's just a little bit less formal. So just like in the worlds of history and science, there are patterns in the stock market that tend to repeat themselves. A successful trader is going to build a keen understanding of these patterns. So as we've discussed, Charts help traders make sense of historical patterns that might repeat themselves in the future. So we want to keep a book of charts as a way to commit to memory these repeatable patterns. A book of charts is a, it's really a catalog of charts, right? It differs from our playbook in that it's less formal. A single entry could be a screenshot of a chart that includes a pattern that you find interesting, something you might have seen repeat in the market enough for you to record it. All right, next we have review work. Okay, when our NFL quarterback finishes the game, win or loss, he doesn't just forget about it and move on. He watches film of the game, and this allows him to learn from mistakes and make adjustments 
for the next game. The same goes for traders. We want to review and detail our trades, especially the biggest opportunities, along with how well we are following our process. Review work can come in many different forms, and this largely depends on your learning style and personality. So on our desk, some traders keep a journal where they jot down everything from execution mistakes and milestones to how they were actually feeling on that day. Some traders record their screens and, like the quarterback, review film of the tape after each trading session. And some keep a daily report card where they grade themselves on a set of criteria that they've defined for the month. But the common thread that I find among effective review methods is detail. Trading is all about making adjustments, so we want to be detailed about the things that we're doing well and want to repeat, and things that we need to adjust and the ways that we'll take action to make these adjustments. So I'm a numbers guy. I like to focus on things that are clearly definable. So I find that keeping a spreadsheet around um, each of my trading businesses is the most helpful to me. So each day I record the variables that factor into the quality of my trades, the risk that corresponds to the quality of these setups, the executions, and the environment, which informs me of which plays to make. So this allows me to see quickly and in detail which parts of my trading needs attention. I call my spreadsheet the trade log, and I actually did a video about it, and we can link it here. Um, you may be starting to notice how these processes are linked together and how important, for example, having a clearly defined playbook can help us review our trades relative to our clearly defined plays. So next, let's talk about research. Okay? The market's always changing. Environments shift back and forth between bull and bear markets, fast and slow markets, momentum and ranging markets, and the most successful traders on our desk have not only been able to develop a setup with edge, but they've been able to broaden their playbook to include multiple plays for various environments. So this breadth will allow you to make money consistently. So imagine you're a guitar player who can rip a guitar solo as well as anyone in the world. You feel that your finger picking chops, however, are poor. You want to be able to get called for those jobs where intricate rhythm playing is crucial, especially if guitar solos go out of style. So how will you go about this? You're, you're going to examine the best examples of finger-picking styles, learn them, practice them, spend a year figuring out how to apply this to your own playing. So in trading, we have the opportunity to do the same. And much of this is done through market research. So I spend a good chunk of my time conducting research, and this work does not pay off immediately. But in the long run, it can be incredibly powerful. So that's why we want to build research into our process. So you might have an idea. You might find 100 examples of this idea. You might extract statistics from these 100 examples and study them, refine your idea, come up with a setup that's not just a theory, but now has the statistics to back it up. Some of my best plays have come from this practice, and it's, it's actually, it can be creative, it can be fun. You know, it's definitely fun when it can make you money. And, you know, on the weekends or when the market's slow, I think it's a good practice to take an idea, look into it, let that process kind of take you down a rabbit hole, and you might find more edge in an existing play doing this as well. So you might add breadth to your playbook. You know, this kind of curiosity and in-depth work is definitely a common thread throughout the most successful traders on our desk and I think is paramount to fostering longevity in the business because as we said before the market's always changing so if you're interested in hearing more about the process we take when developing a play I made a video about it and we can link it here so now let's talk about technology um, you know technology is not just a tool it's it's a skill so in trading we can use technology to our advantage and we can create market filters that alert us to tickers that are trading a certain way. We can create indicators that alert us to special market conditions. We can write scripts that trade stocks for us based on specific criteria. And we can back test our strategies as part of our, our own market research. So 
the more we understand how to use the technology, the more powerful we become as traders. So this is why I build technology work into my process. I make sure that each week I'm spending time either creating a technology that can give me an advantage or increasing my skills so that I'm able to do more technology. So frankly, the more skills I obtain, the more time a week I find myself spending on technology because it's just that powerful. So, you know, the world's evolving quickly all the time and, you know, the, the trading world's evolving right along with it. And so my advice to any new trader is to start early and begin developing tech skills. Uh, this can be as simple as getting to know your platform inside and out or as advanced as learning how to code. Um, you you know, you don't want to find yourself playing the PGA Tour with a wooden driver, right? And that worked in the 70s, but today you'd be at a great disadvantage with the titanium clubs that are available. So, you know, there was a time when traders operated on the trading floor, reading, you know, the energy of the pit and shouting over one another, passing pieces of paper to get orders filled. When that world changed and technology allowed traders to operate upstairs on computers, it was it was actually traders like Linda Ratchke who adapted, learned new technology and were able to survive and, and even flourish amidst that transition. So I try to be like Linda and you know use her as inspiration and build into my own process ways to stay one step ahead of the competition when it when it comes to um, you know new developments and technology and things like that. All right, so let's talk about game planning. Every day in the market is different. Right? There's different flows, different stocks in play, different market narratives. So just as a basketball coach will cater his or her approach to a specific team with specific matchups, tactics, a trader will design a game plan before each trading session. So depending on your style, this might include specific stocks that you're watching, key price levels, fresh catalysts in the market, and any economic data that might be released during the day. As traders, we often operate with if-then statements, right? So like, if my stock does this, then I will do this. Basing your game plan on if-then statements is a solid way to focus your pre-market preparation. And just like the basketball coach, you'll most likely be forced to modify this game plan with game time decisions once the market opens. And this, this is fine, but starting with an outline of what you're looking for it really helps us streamline our efforts and stay focused, and then we stay flexible and open-minded once the market opens. All right, let's talk about trading rules. So we have our playbook, we understand our setups inside and out, we know what market variables need to be present for us to enter the trade, and we have outlined how to execute these trades. To put it simply, we have trading rules. So the market can be tricky, right? So Jesse Livermore, the great stock trader from the 1920s once said, the stock market is never obvious. It's designed to fool most of the people most of the time. This is why we have trading rules. Without rules, it will become very difficult to do the right thing. Instilling these rules as part of our process will help us stay in line with our trading system. So, and in our tr trade review, we can grade ourselves on how well we're following our rules if you've clearly defined your trading system, there's no excuse really for not following these rules. So if you find a flaw in your trading system, it's better to actually modify your system in a calculated way than it is to just break your rules. So imagine you're an algorithm that takes trades only based on specifically predetermined conditions. Would you be able to outline this logic from front to back and follow the system? So I would, I would actually wager that most struggling traders would be surprised to find that they're unable to outline their logic of their system with no holes from front to back. Now let's talk about personal care. So imagine being a concert pianist at Carnegie Hall or a tennis player in the final round at the U.S. Open. Think of the pressure these performers must overcome on a regular basis. These performers often have physical trainers, as well as psychology coaches to keep themselves in gear and ready to face the challenges of peak performance. Trading is a performance too, so therefore 
our own mental and physical health is crucial. So let's outline some of the basic ways the traders on our desk keep themselves in tune. So diet and exercise. Mick Jagger, he's known for his wild antics as the Rolling Stones frontman, but he actually has a serious responsibility and he's found ways to keep himself in peak condition in order to headline stadiums consistently throughout his career, right? And he's not getting any younger. He's still doing it. So as part of his process, he maintains a diet of fruit and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, chicken, fish, and he commits to regular interval training and stretching routine. And I'm not saying anything about the fact that his diet's better than anything else. It's just the fact that he's actually focused on this stuff. So if Mick can do it, why can't we? So as traders, we need to feel energized every day. Most people understand what makes them feel good. So for me, it's running. I love to run in order to clear my mind, get in a good sweat. You know, whenever I let my busy schedule interfere with my running routine, I can start to feel it show up in my training. I lack sharpness. I'm not as energetic. I just don't feel as good. So I do whatever I can to prioritize getting out for a run almost every day. All right, sleep. Sleep is one of those things that is very easy to ignore. I'm totally guilty of this. We all know how important sleep is to our cognitive ability, not to mention our ability to keep up with our workout schedule, which we talked about before. So many of us on the trading desk track our sleep. Some traders will take a step back if they notice they have not gotten a good night's sleep, and that's how much it can affect our performance. Right? Some, sometimes traders will not trade. I do a lot of coding in my script and algorithm development, and I find that a lack of sleep greatly reduces my efficiency and accuracy when writing code. Something that I can really, I mean, it can really make or break my progress. Mindfulness. So in the Oxford Dictionary, mindfulness means the quality or state of being conscious or aware of something. So in trading, this is actually our game. With all the noise and trading signals in the market on a given day, we must be conscious and aware. So I like to use running as a way to clear my mind. I also like to spend time with friends and family as trading can be a pretty solitary journey, especially if you're not on a trading desk, which I am and I'm thankful for that. But some people will use meditation. You might find that self-talk works for you, being kinder to yourself. It'll be a valuable exercise to find out what works for you, what activity helps you gain a clear mind for trading the market. And that naturally leads us into psychology. And this is a big topic that a lot of people talk about, right? As the, the tennis legend Billie Jean King once said, pressure is a privilege. Um, you can't make diamonds without pressure, right? So this is what we're signing up for as traders, okay? So on a certain level, we accept the pressure. That's part of it. It's very natural to feel nervous, upset, under pressure while trading. No serious competitor really in any performance endeavor is gonna escape these feelings. So there's a lot of talk out there on trading psychology. I'm certainly not a psychologist. I have no authority in that matter, but I am a trader and I understand the challenges that we face. Like, you know, I've been there, right? The feeling of a stock dropping as soon as you buy it, disappointment that comes with a bad trade, a bad month, the pressure to perform when you've had a losing streak. And of course, you know, there's the notorious term on tilt used to describe a state of acting irrationally out of emotion when trading. It's easy to let our emotions get in the way of quality decision making. And this is why we have a process. This is why we don't just wing it. Dr. Brett Steenbarger, an associate with the firm and a valuable mentor throughout my career, has written some fantastic books on trading psychology. But as Dr. S would concur, Psychology doesn't matter if you have no edge in the market. A lot of psychological challenges can be solved with having a solid trading system with edge. Let me say that again. It might be easy to conclude that your problems with losing money are due to psychology when in fact you're not trading systems with edge. Therefore, if you focus on the three personal care practices outlined above, you know, diet, exercise, sleep, mindfulness, and combine them with finding a trading system with edge that works for you, you'll be putting yourself in a good position to find success. So we've covered trading fundamentals, our process for growth as well, 
as ways to keep ourselves sharp for performance, is there anything else that we need to be successful? And yes, we need patience, actually. Learning to master anything takes time. Training is certainly no exception. We're competing against the best in the world every day here. So one thing that's helped me tremendously over time is having great mentors because you get to hear about their journeys and also learn from them. So for me, it's been senior traders on the desk like KFITs or trading coaches like Bella or Dr. S. I want to surround myself with people better than me. If you don't have access to a trading desk yet, you could reach out to a successful trader. You might be surprised by how receptive they are. Or you can devour books on trading written by successful traders. I think mimicking successful traders and their process, even their setups, in a lot of cases, is a great practice. So now that we've set up the basics of what stock trading is, what we can do to help ourselves become successful, let's get into the nitty gritty. And the next few sections will cover the basics of how we can find setups with Edge. And we'll go over the ingredients of a profitable strategy and a few specific trading setups. So let's first talk about the ingredients of a profitable strategy. So at this point, you've developed a playbook that you like. You understand what you want to see in the market in order to put the trade on. You might be asking, how do I put this all together so that I can make consistent profits? How can I make this process automatic? So there are a number of factors that I like to consider and drill down into detail in order to hear the trading signal loud and clear. So number one is the environment. Okay, so what kind of market environment are we in? Okay, like what, what plays are conducive to this kind of environment? So say you're trading a long technical breakout, a strategy where we play for a big move when the stock gets above a key price level. But we're in a bear market. All breakouts have been failing. So is this the same technical breakout as one that occurs within a bull market where dozens of stocks are breaking above key levels and running? So the answer is no. The environment matters. Traders on our desk have certain plays for certain market environments. Okay, the second ingredient is the play. So we, we start with the big picture, right? We should clearly define in our playbook what kind of play we're making. Is this a technical breakout in a relative strength stock? Is this a day two earnings breakout? Is this a breaking news play? The big picture idea frames why we're looking for an imbalance between supply and demand. Traders on our desk categorize these plays and understand clearly what kind of play they're making. Stock selection is paramount here. And if this is a high quality play, then we're in the right stock. The big picture informs us, but it doesn't mean that we have a trade yet. So number three is the setup. So have you ever had a big picture idea put on a trade? I mean, I know I have. Only to feel lost in the wild oscillations of the stock as you watch your stop get hit. So to avoid this, traders on our desk wait for the stock to set up. So a stock is set up when conditions that make this play A plus are present. A stock is set up when there is clear risk reward. So create a checklist and make sure that all the checks are in your favor. Say you're trading the technical breakout. The market environment is right for this. You see that the stock looks like it's breaking out. This is not enough. Does it have a strong catalyst? Is the stock doing over 3R vol? Is the sector in play? Is the range on the daily chart compressed enough to make this a powerful trade? Is the time of day appropriate for a breakout? Is the order flow active with offers being taken easily on the tape? These are all questions you might ask yourself before looking to enter the trade. If enough checks are in your favor, then your stock is set up. So now you, you know that you have a trade, but how do you enter? So the fourth ingredient is the trigger. The trigger is the condition that gets you in the trade. Once all the checks are in your favor, you wait for your entry. Within your particular strategy, 
do you like buying the first offer that lifts above the key level? Do you like buying the first pullback and retest after the stock breaks a level? Do you like anticipating the break as long as the stock hasn't moved one daily ATR already? And this could all occur in a split second, especially if it's a fast play such as breaking news or a scalp. So traders on our desk have all kinds of different styles. Each trader has ways to execute that make sense to them. And these triggers are usually specific to the strategy that they're trading. There are nuances to how you might manage a trade and the way you manage the trade highly depends on how you enter the trade. So this needs to be baked into the strategy. Okay, so the final component here is trade management. I once made a fantastic breakout trade in IWM. It had been consolidating for months above a key level and it broke out on volume in a really strong tape. I felt like I was in the driver's seat after all. I'd been waiting for this trade for months and it was working. So three days into the trade, I had substantial open profit, but my target was still much higher and there was nothing to do. So I sat on my hands and then the market started to shift. The tape got weaker. IWM started to lose momentum. My open profit started to deteriorate, but I sat tight. I'd been waiting for this trade. I didn't want to give up, right? I was letting some psychology kind of creep in. I woke up the morning before Thanksgiving to see the entire market along with my IWM position had gapped down significantly. IWM opened well below my stop price. I had turned a big winner into a full loss, which was a terrible way to spend Thanksgiving. So I was furious, not because I'd lost money, but mainly because I had mismanaged the trade. This loss forced me to define much clearer and in more detail the trade management rules for this particular strategy. In this case, I had ignored a handful of the warning signs and I did not have rules in place to deal with these warning signs. So I'm worlds better at trading this strategy now because nothing can get me to manage the trade poorly. I have clearly defined rules for every possible outcome. Different traders have different styles, as we said before, but there's going to be a trade management method that best suits you and your strategy. So knowing how you will manage a trade before entering will help avoid a lot of the confusion and poor decision making that, that I experienced with IWM. One of my top plays is capturing a market trend day, and these are rare but highly profitable. So if you're patient and strike with intention, these can be great. So I made a video outlining the factors of this play and we can link it above. Let's talk about specific trading strategies now. So there are no two traders on our desk that are exactly alike. Right? Each trader has their own cognitive strengths, own playbooks, each trade their own setups in unique ways. So Jack Schwager interviewed dozens of highly successful traders in his classic trading series, Market Wizards, which is an awesome book, by the way, um, if you haven't read it. One of the first trading books I ever read. One of the conclusions he drew from the interviews was that there are a million ways to make money in the markets. The irony is that they are all very difficult to find, and that's, that's his quote. So while the following strategies are real-world applications, completely legit ways to trade the market, they are basic introductory-level guidelines. So you'll want to add detail, nuances, and your own twist in order to capture the true edge in the trade. So again, these are outlines. Support and resistance. So remember the supply and demand levels that we discussed in the technical analysis section? When trading price action, identifying high quality price levels is really important. And this is because stock prices tend to react off these levels. So one way they can react is by failing and reversing. So a support or resistance play is made when a stock trades into a significant price level and we play for that level to hold. So in this chart, QQQ tested the same level four times before failing. And you might have identified that the stock is in a downtrend and you think the likelihood of it continuing along the current path of least resistance is high. So in this situation, you can key in on this significant supply zone to get great risk reward on a short trade. You might look for a failure to follow through, 
You might look for volume to dry up, a change of character on the tape. There are many factors that can set up this play for you, but the key is that this basic support or resistance concept plays into the fundamental principles of supply and demand at a significant level. Breakout. So what happens if a significant price level cannot hold? Well, we might actually have a breakout on our hands. So a breakout play is made when price compresses, builds up energy against a significant price level, and then takes that level out with significant volume. This can cause a cascade of momentum to surge into the stock and follow through in the direction of the breakout. Recall our SMCI example from earlier. So we've discussed how important the volume was on this breakout, highlighted here in the blue shaded areas. And this is an hourly chart. So let's zoom out to a daily chart and assess the trading range that it broke out of. So we can see the stock failed three times at 116 over the course of three months in a tight trading range before it broke on massive volume. Price compression builds energy for the stock. The volume on the breakout gives it fuel. A breakout is often due to a catalyst or an entire sector move in the market. In this case of SMCI, this was a massive quarterly earnings beat and guidance raise amidst an artificial intelligence theme that was igniting many of the semiconductor names. It had all the ingredients of a good breakout trade. Quite often, the time of day is important as the most participation and price expansion typically occurs in the morning. So next we have mean reversion. So if a stock runs far enough after breaking out that it becomes significantly extended from its mean, like a stretched rubber band, it will often snap back violently to its mean. So a mean reversion play is made when an overextended stock trades back to its mean. This is often a counter trend trade and made on intraday time frames. So do you remember hearing about the meme stock madness in 2021? GME traded from, as we talked about before, below 20 to almost 500 in less than a month. So this kind of move is extremely rare. Here's GME on the daily chart, and the price is adjusted for stock splits and stuff like that. So it gets a little weird historically, but it's the same chart. Notice how steep it gets. Notice how extended from its moving averages it gets. Notice the volume that comes into the stock. When GME got overextended, it eventually offered a fantastic intraday breakdown trade, shown here on this one minute chart. Notice the intraday trading range marked by the blue rectangle, the breakdown below VWAP, the increased volume, and the volume climax at the low. So a stock can run further than expected. So it's critical, just like in any play, to have proper trading signals in place and plenty of checks in your favor, especially with these extension plays, because they really can move further than we think before the trade is truly set up. So now let's talk about momentum scalping. So some stocks, when they're in play, have tremendous order flow. This means that traders are able to gain a lot of real-time information from watching the tape. A trader might identify a significant hole in the bid and then see them pay the offer aggressively. Or a trader can join in on this order flow and look to exit when the pattern changes. Sometimes a trader will combine this order flow with significant price levels to gain edge in the trade. So these are very short-term moves and require quick thinking and decision-making skills. So these four strategies are guidelines. They are starting points. So you can start with something simple like a breakout strategy and develop it further, adding your own twist. So, you know, say you're very good at dissecting earnings reports and you do well when trading stocks that are in play with fresh news catalysts. You might specialize in day one earnings breakouts. Your checklist of trade attributes, environments, and triggers will be specified to earnings day one situations. All right, so to wrap it up, there's there's a lot of dogmatic trading talk out there. So most people think that their way is the only way, right? If you go online, you hear a lot of opinions and things like this. And some people will claim that fundamentals are king. Others will say technicals are the only thing that matters. 
right? Reading the tape is the only way to do it. Looking at charts is the only way to do it. Some consider buying breakouts to be chasing and others actually make a living buying breakouts, right? So what is correct, right? So from my experience, there are many different and valid ways to trade. I see it on the desk all the time. The key is finding what you see really well. So everybody is different with different cognitive abilities. And I see it on our trading desk every day, various styles, time frames, setups, and all with edge. So my advice is find what excites you and what makes a lot of sense to you because that's probably where you will excel. So we've covered a lot today. If you have any questions about any of this, please put them in the comments below and I'll be sure to get to them. So good luck out there. And as always, thank you for all your support of our channel. Cheers. So you're an active trader, not doing as well as you want, not doing as well as you deserve. And you just can't figure out why you can't become profitable no matter how hard you try. Well, let me show you why. This is your competition. The traders in this room. This room right here is full of elite traders, some of whom are making seven and even eight figures a year. In fact, our top guys have made nearly 20 million each in net trading profits in a single year. Let's head to my office so I can share more. So you're probably used to seeing videos of lavish trader lifestyles, trading gurus, trading off of a laptop for an hour a day, heck, maybe even 15 minutes a day, and then them relaxing on some secluded beach for the rest of the day. Well, all I can tell you is that our traders train like pro athletes. They live and breathe the markets and are continually working on their trading skills. Because at our firm, that's what we found it really takes to make it in this game. I'm Mike Bellafiori, co-founder and managing partner of SMB Capital, one of the world's top proprietary trading firms located in Midtown Manhattan. And we're always looking for trading talent to hire and develop and not just to trade in-house on our desk, but also to trade from their own home, entirely using our firm's capital. And we have numerous traders doing just that, allowing them to make upwards of seven figures trading the firm's capital without risking their own money. But to even get a shot at something like that, you need to have the right training. That's why we're doing a new free online presentation in which we share how you can get an interview with SMB to become an in-house or remote trader, trading firm capital without risking yours and gaining access to all of our firm's coaching and resources. And the best part, you don't have to be a profitable trader yet. In fact, we prefer to mold profitable traders with our methods and our techniques. That's why we have just three simple criteria that can earn anyone an interview. We're looking for highly ambitious and determined traders who fit our culture first and foremost. So if you believe that could be you, sign up for the free one hour online presentation by clicking the link that's in your top right corner of your screen now.